Hello and welcome to The Crime Reel. For many, the term dueling banjos immediately brings to mind the infamous music scene from the 1972 American thriller, Deliverance. However, for today's true crime narration, the story of two banjos takes on an entirely different meaning. Thanks to Arthur Tonian, who suggested today's case that occurred in their hometown of West Milton, Ohio, back in 1991. At that time, the population of West Milton hovered at around 4,500 people. This small town had a close-knit community and was seen by many as a great place to live. With this sense of safety, the local headlines on the 22nd of May 1991 must have been all the more jarring. Milton Mann held for murder. Newspapers told the story of how 63-year-old Edward Benson was being held in Miami County Jail, Ohio, on an aggravated murder charge. As more details of his crime emerged, it made for some unusual news headlines, particularly in light of the strange dueling banjos link. Edward lived on Kessler Frederick Road with his wife, 60-year-old Katie Benson. The couple lived alone as by this time their seven children had all moved on having families of their own. Edwards and Katie's house was tucked away at the end of a lane behind two other houses. Their neighbours described them as nice, quiet folk who were good for a smile and a wave but did not socialise much. Edwards suffered from a number of ongoing health problems for which he took 17 different medications. This prevented him from working and over time he and Katie as good as stopped leaving their house. However, in the spring of 1991, this suddenly changed and the couple went out most evenings. Edward had gone back to playing the banjo and was part of a local bluegrass band. This is a band which typically consists of four to seven performers who sing while accompanying themselves on acoustic string instruments. On the 22nd of May 1991, at 5.01am, Edward phoned 911 stating that his wife needed help. When the emergency services arrived, they found that Katie had sustained serious head injuries. She had been bludgeoned with a banjo until that banjo was completely destroyed, after which the beating continued with a second banjo. Katie was rushed to the Stauder Hospital, but was not able to survive her injuries. She was pronounced dead at 5.53 a.m. After calling 911, Edward had then called an attorney. When his attorney arrived, they advised Edward not to answer any questions. Edward was arrested and charged with aggravated murder. He was held on a $50,000 cash bond. His attorney argued for a property bond instead, claiming that his client was not a flight risk, having lived in Miami County for more than 50 years. This was denied and Edward was taken to Miami County Jail. Miami County Chief Deputy Charles Price said that he had been an officer for 30 years and that's the first banjo killing I've seen. It's just kind of bizarre. Whilst the authorities were convinced that they had solved the case, Edward claimed that someone had assaulted and murdered his wife during a burglary of their house. Three days after her murder, Katie was laid to rest at Stillwater Cemetery in West Milton. As forensic evaluations were conducted to determine Edward's mental condition at the time of the offence and whether or not he was competent to stand trial, Edward changed his plea to not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. In July 1991, he was deemed competent to stand trial. However, the following month, further psychological tests were ordered. These were conducted over the following weeks with Edward being in and out of hospital during this time due to his other health conditions. In August of 1991, two of Edward's sons, Wilbur and Edward G, visited their father in jail. Edward G wanted to see if he was really as bad as we'd been hearing. During their conversation they discussed many things and Edward seemed completely coherent. Edward G went on to ask his father about his mother's death. 
Edward said that prior to the attack he had been taking different medication. When his son asked why he killed his mother, Edward replied, When I got started, I couldn't stop. When I started, I just got into a rage and couldn't stop. When Wilbur spoke to his father, he too felt that there had been no change in his father's mental capacity since Wilbur had last seen him the year before. During their conversation, Edward alleged to Wilbur that his mother was having an affair. Wilbur did not believe this allegation and felt that it was being used by Edward to in some way excuse his actions. Edward also said that he could not remember what had happened on the morning of the murder. At a competency hearing held in November 1991, both brothers testified with this information and also confirmed that Edward had had psychiatric treatment in the past. When Edward G was asked at the hearing if he wanted his father to stand trial, he replied, It is my desire. If there is nothing wrong with him mentally, my mother shouldn't have died that way. On the 20th of November, it was ruled that Edward was not competent to stand trial. It was concluded that he suffered from short-term memory impairment brought on by medical problems that negatively affected his ability to stand trial. Whilst he was said to understand the nature of the proceedings against him, he was unable to assist his attorney in preparing his defence. Edward was committed to Dayton Forensic Hospital in a maximum security unit, whereupon he could receive treatment for up to 15 months. At a later date there would be further competency hearings as, based on expert opinion with proper treatment, there is a substantial probability that he may become competent to stand trial within a year. Edward's treatment would include stress reduction, learning new skills, stabilisation of medical problems and monitoring the proper ingestion of medicines. During this time, Edward filed a complaint against two of his children, Edward G and Catherine, who were co-administrators of Katie's estate. Edward's attorney was disputing a claim with the attorney of Kate's estate, who said that her property should be treated as if Edward preceded her in death, thus depriving him of any benefits. Edward's attorney claimed that denial of benefits would violate Edward's constitutional rights. It is unclear exactly how this claim was resolved, but shortly afterwards, Edward G and Catherine filed a lawsuit for the benefit of the next of kin claiming that Edward had wrongfully inflicted injuries to Katie, therefore causing her death. The result, they claimed, had been the loss of Katie's support and guidance, along with the mental anguish suffered. A judgment of $250,000 was sought, with a jury trial being requested. This was later ruled in Edward G and Catherine's favour, although the amount of damages awarded is unknown. On the 17th of April 1992, the aggravated murder indictment was dismissed when it was ruled that Edward was unable to stand trial. The judge ruled that Edward was a mentally ill person who was incompetent to stand trial and unlikely to be competent within a year, even with treatment. Edward would be held in a restricted environment and if he was later released or found to be competent, the case could be refiled at that stage. Dr. Daniel Gold Jr. stated that Edward suffered from impairment of his ability to think and remember. This man's brain certainly does not function normally. There are many reasons why it can't and can't be expected to. In addition, he had an array of serious medical problems, including heart disease, lung problems and diabetes, which further complicated his treatment. Shortly after this announcement, two of Edward's daughters, Karen and Melba, along with his daughter-in-law, Sue, expressed concerns about their safety and how Edward's movements would be monitored going forward, stating that, We feel we're in danger already. Sue, who was married to Edward G, said that they wanted Edward to be in a maximum security facility, not some rest home or a VA hospital, so he can just walk away. The three women went on to say that they believed Edward was faking mental incompetency and described abusive behaviour that had happened throughout their lives. Karen said that, We feel he's faking it. He always said he could kill her and get out of it 
adding that her father had always studied court proceedings on TV. She said that her father, who doctors termed a chronic alcoholic, was a very manipulative person. He had attended counselling for alcohol abuse after Karen and her sister had sought charges against him in 1987 after he had severely beaten their mother. On another occasion, Katie told Karen that Edward had threatened to cut her up and bury her in the garden. Karen believed that after 40 years of sustained abuse, her mother was brainwashed. It was the only life that she had ever known. No matter what happened, Katie always returned to Edward, even though she knew that she was in danger. In a further painful twist to the story, around the time Edward was declared incompetent, a family member told Karen that her mother had got what she had deserved, saying that, you might as well forget your mum and go on with your life. Karen believed that her mother knew that she would not live for much longer. Just the week before her brutal murder, Katie gave Karen a box of childhood memorabilia, her baby bracelet and school pictures. Edward died just over two years after the murder on the 14th of October 1993, having never stood trial for his crime. That concludes today's case. Thanks for listening and please add any comments down below. Thanks once again to Arthur Tonian for suggesting covering this case. Thank you for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. While filming a canoeing scene in the film Deliverance, Ned Beatty was thrown overboard and was sucked under by a whirlpool. He didn't surface for 30 seconds. Director Sir John Borman asked Beatty, how did you feel? And Beatty responded, I thought I was going to drown. And the first thought was, how will John finish the film without me? And my second thought was, I bet the bleep bar steward will find a way. Goodbye.